Welcome back to the IBJJF podcast. My guest today is Bruno Bastos, and today we're going to talk about the IBJJF Absolute Grand Prix. This event goes down Friday, November 18th, and it's brought to you exclusively by Black Armor Kimonos. Bruno, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the opportunity. IBJJF, once again, we're here to try to deliver good information for the, our audience. Yeah, we've got so much to talk about. Let's start with the IBJJF Absolute Grand Prix, eight-man bracket. Let's start with Kainan Duarte. Kainan's a two-time world champion in the Gi, trains at Atos, really well-rounded competitor, extremely technical, great sweeps from the single leg X guard, great knee cut passing. What do you think makes Kainan such a great competitor? Uh, I believe his ability of, like I said, be well-rounded. Uh, I think the term is misunderstood sometimes. People are gonna say they're well-rounded. Oh, that guy, he's a little bit good in everything. Kainan is really good <laughs> yeah. in everything. Right, he uh, he knows how to win a match if he has to hold, but he knows how to finish a match. He has really good takedowns. He has really good sweeps, especially the, the single leg X, like you were saying, the X guard as well. Really good top pressure on the passing. You know, he's a good back taker. He has good guillotines that he applies even in a gi. You know, so. I think that variety of attacks is what makes him a threat for everybody. He's one of my favorite pound-for-pound uh, pound athletes to, to watch when he competes because it's always like, I always like to see the details of how he gets to the road to the victory against his opponents. Uh, so excited to have him on the, on the Grand Prix. Um, and again, I think the, because he's really good liking everything, that's the biggest threat. He, he knows how to be strategic, uh, but is a guy that always going to look for the finish as well. Not only is he super technical, super well-rounded, but he's also been competing extremely well recently. He's won the last two world championships, 2021, 2022. So he's coming into this with a lot of momentum. As that he, like when, when you talk about his victories, like he dominate like both years, right? He dominate both years. It's not, it's not that he didn't have like anybody that, could push him like he didn't have easy matches, uh, but he controlled every match, and I think he showed that he was uh, above uh, the competition, right? Uh, he didn't have the same luck on the on the absolute, but when it come uh, uh, when it come to his division, man, he's been dominant. Uh, I think if if he focuses on that, he's gonna keep being dominant on that division for a little bit. Let's move on to Cyborg, the next competitor in the Absolute GP. Cyborg won the 2019 Grand Prix. It was a no-gi heavyweight GP, had an amazing run there. He's also the 2022 Pan Champion in the gi. What do you think has made Cyborg so effective and so good into his later years in his career? The fact that he's a Cyborg, <laughs> <laughs> right? Man, Cyborg and I, we have the same age. Like, we still produce by a couple of months. Like, I'm 42, he's turning 42. Now, um, we have competed against each other since back 2005, right? So, and I think maybe on the on the beginning of his career when he didn't have the results that he's having now, uh, maybe was the transition moving to the United States, he's too young and have to run his own business, where now he, ve he has a very good structure uh, of his business, people that are uh, working with him, teaching, management, association, all that stuff. And he really can focus on being a full-time athlete, you know. Uh, and I have always had the theory that uh, the Masters uh, 1 to 3, right, he's a Masters 3 now, uh, but the Masters 1 to 3, in one match, they can beat, like, any any adult in one match. Now, competition is different. But Cyborg, he he breaks my theory because he's the current pen champion, <laughs> uh, current no gi world champion, <laughs> and like all, all in adult division, right? I think his understanding of competition is second to none. He knows very well how to compete, how to push and pace himself at the same time. He's a guy that once he gets in a good spot, it's really hard for you to get him out of that position. And he's he extremely explosive. So he's a guy as well that's really hard for you to hold into, like to 
to stop him if you if you have to hold him for a score point or something like that so i think th those uh physical and technical attributes and then the understanding of competition is what makes him a threat on that grand prix and then for sure even at the age of 42 be competitive and one of the favorites to win Absolutely. He had a great final at the 2022 Pans with Gutenberg Pereira. So let's talk about Gutenberg because that's a match matchup that I would like to see a rematch of if possible. But Gutenberg is a 2022 Brazilian National Openweight Champion. He got silver at the Pans, losing to Cyborg in the final. Also got silver at the Worlds, losing to Victor Hugo in the final. But he's had an amazing 2022 season. Gutenberg is extremely technical. He's got really great submissions, really good guard passing. And one of my favorite matches last year was actually his open weight final at the Brazilian Brazilian Nationals. He fought Marcus Scooby and got a submission. Scooby's an incredible competitor who I'm yes. a big fan of as well. So let's talk about Gutenberg. How do you feel about Gutenberg's game and what he needs to do to win this GP? Yeah, so first time I saw Gutenberg competing, he was a purple belt. Uh, he's, still, he's still very young, but like, I, I remember watching him as a purple belt and really like his style. Uh, a guy as well that can do all, right? Top, bottom, standing, uh, really good guard, even though he's like a big guy, but really good guard, really flexible, uh, really good passing, really good pressure. Uh, I believe he, uh, when it comes to Jiu Jitsu IQ, he's one of the highest Jiu Jitsu IQ that I have like seen in the competition. I got a really enjoy to watch as well. Uh, at the, at, the, at the walls was like a detail there that like stopped him from winning and i think that's the only thing that is missing for him like is a world title right uh as as adult but i think he's a threat on the grand prix he's uh, like a very strong very technical i think his guard and not only offensive but defensively can help him a lot with some of the, the of the opponents that he he for sure gonna have when it comes to the passing side and then i think his understanding of like passing as well making him a threat i see i see him uh as one of the favorites as well like i'm sure of course like i just said kind of one of the favorites i bought one of the favorites and now i'm going to gutenberg and then but for me those are the three names uh of course we're going to talk about the orders but i think those are the three names that i see uh at least in my view with like be with the favorites of course you have to see the bracket how gonna be if they're gonna use the ranking or titles all those things but um gutenberg is like for, uh, for me is one of the, the top six on the grand prix and then a favorite to win as well yeah, it's been so fun to watch him recently. He does that really cool arm bar from the lasso position. I got a chance to ask him about that. He said he's been doing it forever and he's gotten it a lot in competition. But I always watch, love watching him compete and seeing him go for submissions like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The guy that I told him, I wanted him to come to my school. We've been <laughs> probably seeing just trying to figure out the date because, <laughs> man, as again, a big a big guy, but it's kind of like that 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 saying that some people are like, oh, he's a big guy that moves like a little guy, right? That applies to Gutenberg. And so they're going to be the big guy that moves like a little guy, but with the big guy pressure, Definitely. <laughs> you know, so I'm really excited to watch him perform. I'm excited to watch the whole Grand Prix, the whole Grand Prix, the whole Super Fights, of course, going over all this, but uh, really good uh, pick from BJJF to, to be on the Grand Prix. Let's talk about Heater Zuki. Heater's also a 2022 Brazilian national champion. What stands out to me about his game is his back attacks. He has a lot of finishes from the back, and he gets there off guard passes quite often and, and other positions off sweeps as well. What do you like about Heater's game, and how do you think he matches up with some of these other competitors? Yeah, I think, like you said, the back attacks that he has, I think uh, he's uh, probably the dark horse, right? The disruptor, I think he's the guy that can surprise uh, uh the, the the favorites all right i think for him I'm gonna depend uh I, of course i'm gonna i'm gonna repeat myself gonna depends a lot on the how the bracket gonna go yeah but he's a guy that he if he can get on his positions uh it's gonna be very hard to stop him because he has very good control and sub submission awareness as well and because and because of or because of this like the risk of that your opponent is going to have to always have to watch uh, all right for his submission attempts especially like when he gets to the back i i think that's going to be what's going to put him in a contention to be a, a a dark horse and then uh 
be able to to put it off the, the win on the Grand Prix. He's had a really great year this year, and he's done a lot of tournaments in Brazil and had great results there. So I think people are going to get more familiar with his name as he competes a bit more in the U.S., but in Brazil, he's been killing it and winning a lot of, a lot of competitions. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And I, I think that that's the, the next level, uh, the next step to go to the next level for his career, right? Uh, uh, compete here more, more often, I think. Also, the Grand Prix is a great opportunity for him to show his skills here for... Uh, for the American audience, all right? And then, like, of course, we have fans and we have worlds here, and we have no gear worlds here. So when, when, when it comes to that, it is important. I think it is important overall for the uh, athletes to understand that to be on the next level of their career, they have they have to be competing in the United States as well. So I think that's important. Like, that's where a lot, a lot of the portals are going to have. I mean, you have to win those Grand Prix now uh, for men and women, all right? So... I think, again, that's a great opportunity for him to show his skills and then, like, put a stamp, like, on, 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 uh, as far as his name being on the map. Absolutely. Another competitor who's had great results in Brazil, who did come to the U.S. for the Nogi Pans, is Enrique Sacconi. Sacconi won the Open Class at the Pan Nogi. He also won the Open Class earlier this year at the Brasileiro Nogi. He prefers to compete without the Gi, but he has great takedowns, great control, great passing. How do you feel about Sacconi's game, and what do you think about his recent results at the Pan Nogi? Uh, like, you, like you said, Danny, like he is more known on the Nogi. Thing, right, like you want no gi, no gi pens, like you said, you want no gi Brazilian nationals. Uh, of course, he, go, he, he competes a lot in no gi, but I think, especially his takedown game and top control, making him a threat uh, on that on that Grand Prix. I don't know how gonna how gonna be um, his defense when it comes to more like uh, let's let's say. He facing Gutenberg, and then like now he has to do lapel guard stuff like that, right? So which, okay, yes, he has great jujitsu, and like a lot of people talk about like oh a gi person, no gi person for me is all jujitsu. If you good in jujitsu, understanding jujitsu, you're gonna be able to compete in both, and then you're gonna be able to to show that. But of course, he's focusing more on the no gi. So that for me is the only is the only question. Uh, they're gonna be like they, they like question mark. They're gonna be on how he's gonna perform, but I think his style of like takedowns and top pressure uh, can cause problems for a lot of people in the Grand Prix, and then and then eventually get him to be able as well to 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 threat for the for the gold medal uh, at the end of the Grand Prix. Let's talk about another competitor who has competed a bit more nogi recently, Elder Cruz. Elder's a black belt under Lucas Leitch, representing Checkmat. He did win the Worlds as a brown belt in 2022, mm -hmm. but since getting his black belt, he's competed mostly without the gi. He has a pretty similar game to Zaconi. I feel like he has great takedowns, great top control. Do you feel this similar? Do you have similar sentiments about Elder and what he'll need to do to win the Grand Prix? Yeah, I see a lot of similarity, but I see I see Elder with. From what I see, and then no, especially in the no gi, a little bit more guard uh, game, and I think that's important because, man, if you see the names on the Grand Prix, you're gonna need to you're gonna need to be able to deal with people when you're on your back or on your top. All right, I think Elder is still like very young. Uh, one one was a, a brown belt, very athletic. Uh, very explosive, you know, and he's a great competitor. That's one thing that I trademark from like check math athletes. Sometimes you're gonna on the check math athletes, you don't gonna see like maybe maybe you're gonna see a guy that you don't think is the best guy, but he's a great competitor, right? Because sometimes in the competition is not about who is the best, it's about who competes better. And then I think Elder, even though he's very young, he's a great competitor. Uh, and I think be, I think that's like the main thing that that put him in the contention to surprise the favorites and and take home the the Grand Prix title. 
Another guy that could surprise the favorites is Francisco Lowe. He's the last mm-hmm. last competitor in this Grand Prix. Francisco won the Brazilian Nationals in the medium heavy division in 2022 at Brown Belt. Got his black belt. Since he got his black belt, he's come to the U.S. He competed at the Pan No Gi. He got third, ended up losing a really close match to Manuel Hibamar. But he also had one of the best submissions of the year over Oliver Taza in his first round match. It was an incredible flying triangle armbar submission that yeah. went viral online. And then recently he competed in the Gi at the Houston Fall Open, and he got a win over Bruno Matias in the final via submission. Three fights, three submissions at the Houston Open. What do you know about Francisco Lowe, and do you think his submission skills present a real threat to a lot of these competitors in the Absolute GP? Yeah, so like first time, uh, so I knew I knew the name uh, because I have a kid that w- uh, works with me that knows him, uh, and then I watch him compete on Pens, and I remember like that that kid Felipe talking to me about a hey, watch for that guy Francisco, like he's gonna do very well. I was like, oh okay, I, I wanna pay, I wanna pay attention, and then. Man, he went on a tear. Uh, only Hibama was able to stop him, but in a really, really close match. Uh, I think the fact that Francisco always threatening with submissions from the bottom and from the top, yeah. from everywhere, going to neck, arms, and legs. So back attack. It's not. It's not just like oh, watch for one thing. It's not that, right? Um, and he's in a position that. He doesn't. He doesn't have any pressure on himself, right? He was the 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 last man, the, the lightest one, if I'm not wrong. Yes, all right, the, the, the lightest one, and then all he's gonna have to do is go there and fight and entertain people. So that's another thing, right? And then I think that uh, that is what can make him attract to people. The fact that he is like very mission oriented, but not just one or oh, one trick pony shot. No, it's not that. Like from everywhere, top and bottom. Uh, excited to see how he's gonna perform. Really excited to see how gonna be the bracket because I think that once the bracket is reviewed, we're gonna have some first round like super fights already. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and then like I'm sure I'm sure that Francis is gonna gonna do well as well. I know you've mentioned the bracket a couple times, and of course that's going to be a huge part of who comes out on top. But going through all these athletes, if you had to pick a winner for this bracket, who do you see coming out with the Grand Prix absolute victory? Uh, uh, if like b- being like very ra- rational, uh, I would have to pick Kainan based on his last results, like won the two world championships, the last two world championships, very solid on his performance. His career uh, in Gi and Ogi speak for, for himself uh, for not only results but performances as well, right? So, like, rational, like, he would be the one. And I think uh, I always gonna root for a Cyborg to show that the Masters can do well as well on the, on the video of the adults, right? And then, like, but it's like the first three that we talk about, Kainan, Cyborg, and Gutenberg are uh, the ones that I see as a favorite. But I'll put Kainan on the on the number one spot as, as far as being the favorite. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see these matches. Like you said, some of the first round matches are going to be super fights that could headline any other card. So it's going to be incredible. 100%. 100%. Cannot wait. November 18, guys, getting close. Yes, very close. Let's move on to the super fights because we have five incredible super fights as well. I think the first one we should talk about about is Roosevelt Souza versus Jonathan Alves. These guys both had matches, super fights on the last Grand Prix card, and they both said that they weren't happy with their performances in those matches. So this one is an open weight match, of course. Roosevelt has about 100 pounds on Jonathan Alves. What do you think Jonathan Alves has to do to overcome that size disadvantage and win this match? I think uh, first of all, first of all, like when they announced that match, the whole the whole internet was like, "What? <laughs> what? What?" <laughs> but you can fit two Jordans inside Roosevelt, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, but I understand that they are not happy with their last performance. Uh, I understand that they want to showcase their skills again. I think the fact that it is a absolute match is awesome like open weight matches awesome because often you're gonna see people that dominate their divisions that you're always wondering how they would do against bigger opponents if they would go on absolute and like jonathan's that case like he doesn't have a world title yet right 
but man, he has won like pretty much everything. He's still very young, amazing talent. Uh, it, it is one of those guys that if he would go and absolute at pens or Wolves, the size would be very hard for him because it's not just one match. You have to win four or five matches to be absolute champion, right? But to go in one match, now he can test his skills against Roosevelt. Um, Roosevelt really strong, really like sharp foot locks, right? Knee bars. Uh, I think Jonathan key for him is be able to display uh, guard on the way to the back. And or in case of Roosevelt Pool, because Roosevelt is like a really good guard player as well. In case of Roosevelt Pool guard, he'd be able to avoid the attacks and make him away from the back from the top. All right, that's something that like uh, AOJ athletes are really good at. And I think I think I can see Jonathan being able to do that from the bottom and or from the top. Uh, and then I think for Roosevelt gonna be more about distance management. Uh, because Jonathan is going to be the faster, all right? And then is, is, when you say the smaller, doesn't sound like uh, an advantage, but on that case, can be an advantage for him to be the smallest, you know? Uh, so for Roosevelt, going to be about, like, keep uh, distance management to be able to do his mission attacks. And for Jonathan, going to be about being tight and finding his way to the back because I think that's the key to victory for him. That's going to be an incredible fight. We can't wait for that one. It's going to, who knows how that's going to play out. <laughs> exactly. So next we have Andy Murasaki of Atos taking on Mateus Rodriguez of AOJ. These guys have fought three times in the lower belts and had mixed results, but both of these guys are really strong athletes, really athletic. Andy has great passing. I think Mateus plays a little bit more on bottom, but of course mm -hmm. Andy has a great guard too. What do you think about this matchup and what do you think the keys to victory are for each athlete? Oh, uh -huh. For me personally, that's my favorite match of the all super fights, right? Uh, because the two kids that I see coming up all the way from the juveniles, uh, all the amazing results. Uh, as you mentioned, like uh, Mateus, a little bit more uh, guard uh, player, but and he's still like a really good guard. I think both of them are black belt world champion materials, right? I think they they're gonna become uh, black belt world champions and uh man that that's like, my that, that's why it's my it's my favorite match it's like i see more like Mateus playing on the bottom and then like and that's the battle like can andy uh figure the puzzle or can Mateus use his guard to to get to to the to the victory right um I think going to be a very close match. That doesn't mean boring at all. I think they're going to be a lot of, lot of fighting for positions. Um, they both explosive. They both like with a lot of gas tank. Um, I'll put the edge a little bit for Andy because he's been competing more uh, lately. So uh, ju just just for, for that. But I think going to be a lot of, of the Mateus guard versus Andy passing the, on that match. I think one other interesting thing about that match is that Mateus won the Brown Belt Worlds 2021 at medium heavy. Andy has competed a lot at lightweight. I know he moved up to middle for the Worlds, but I spoke to him recently and he said he only walks around about 175, 180. I would assume mm -hmm. Mateus walks around quite a bit heavier. Do you think that'll play an important factor in this match too? I don't, I don't think so because Andy... And he's, he's like, he does well with, with bigger, bigger guys, you know. Uh, and I have trained with, with him myself once I was in Australia for a seminar and he was there. And then like, man. <laughs> <laughs> Strong. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't feel any lightweight top pressure. <laughs> That's not what I felt, right? Um, so I don't think for, uh, I don't think they're going to be a, can be a difference. If Mateus get on the top and then use that weight difference, yes. But I see that match being more like Mateus guard versus any passing. And then on that on that sense, I don't see any difference, uh, any advantage for Mateus like as far as far as size because of any style of passing and any style of jiu-jitsu. Because if you see like he's been doing some opens uh, middleweight, medium heavy. 
and then like like just 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 displaying jiu-jitsu beautifully that's a great point let's move on to the next super fight another aoj black belt jessica Khan. she'll be taking on kaori hernandez in a light featherweight match they've had some matches before i think jessica had some wins over kaori at purple belt but of course they've both evolved a lot since then what do you know about kaori and jessica and how do you feel like this match goes down like two great athletes right uh Jessa, Jessa, uh, I, I, I've seen, I've seen that, like, Jessa, I see since, uh, I pay attention to her since juvenile days because, uh, one of my friends, Emily Fernandez, have fought her in, in an open. Uh, they, they are one year apart, but on the opens, a lot of times they do the juvenile, to, just, just one juvenile together. They don't have juvenile one and two. So because of that, I would always, uh, pay attention on her. I knew that they could compete and then they end up competing against each other. But anyway, so uh, since then I've been I've been watching uh, I've been watching her is a girl that I see with tremendous potential. Um, is a for me is a black belt world champion material as well. I think she's gonna she's gonna be able to to achieve that. Uh, I believe uh, it's the only one, one the only few tests she doesn't have yet. Uh, she is very good compared as well. I think because of yeah, they have a chance in purple belt, but I think that on the back of the mind is is hard at the same time for Kiori. All right, so I want to see how how she's gonna deal with that pressure of having to try get back, uh, and how Jess is gonna mess, uh, manage as well her favorites because she's the favorite for the match, and then uh, that's one thing that people don't talk about. Like sometimes people talk about like oh the pressure of trying to make it but also the pressure of having to manage being their favorite, right? So, interesting match. I think more on favor of uh, Jessica Ken, like based on her last performances or in tournament, not not just their history together, but her last performances. Excited to see them playing Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, it's going to be a great match. Jessa won the pans this year at Light Feather. Kaori got third at Rooster. So they've both been competing really well recently, and I think that'll be a big factor going into it too. Yes, 100%, 100%. The fourth super fight, we have Sergio Rios taking on Jonatas Gracie. Sergio won the Master Worlds this year. Jonatas Gracie is a black belt European champion. I always love watching Sergio compete because he's always attacking the submission from every position, similar to Francisco Lowe, how we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Jonatas is just such a great competitor, great guard, great sweeping ability, and always gets good results in competition. What do you think about this match? Uh, I think Rios is going to be a little bigger than Jonathan, right? I believe so. The match is at medium heavy. Yes. Um, I think um, the style wise that is good for, for Rios because he's going to compete on his natural weight class so uh, Jonathan going up. Um, Sergio is another uh, proof of my theory that like matches can do well against adults in one match. Uh, he has wins over some big names on adult division, right? Uh, but he competed mostly on the Masters. I think Jonathan is a really good competitor, and then the key for him going to be avoid the threat of the mission that Sergio can bring to him, right? Uh, the 10-minute match. So that, in theory, favor Jonathan because that's why he competes all the time with that going to go up from six to ten minutes and then four minutes every competitor gonna gonna say that makes a lot of difference but I think if if Sergio can keep Jonathan on his bubble what I, what I mean by that his bubble of submission threats that's when Sergio can definitely pull off the victory and then I think for Jonathan gonna be more about to manage that those threats as a great compared that he is to be able to like slowly wear where he where he try to wear him down and get in a good position to, to, to win the match. And then when I say get in a good positions, doesn't matter if it's top or bottom because Jonathan Jonathan uh Jonathan's Grace is very very well round as well. All right. And then he, he can play both top and bottom. So it's more about him be able to like pace the match on the on the way that he can wear Sergio down and then try to get the victory for him. Yeah, Sergio has competed quite a bit in the adult divisions. Yeah. Even recently, he won the Phoenix Open, fought some really tough guys. He also won the mm-hmm. Orlando Open and did really well. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think if Sergio can keep firing off the submissions, that's going to be his biggest his biggest threat in the match. 
100%, 100%. Excited. Um, regardless regard of the outcome, I really hope like Sergio does really well because for me, it's nice to see uh, like a, a master athlete having the chance to perform on uh, a professional event, right? Uh, I think a lot of master athletes would do very well on the same circumstance. Um, I don't know if Abijef has any interest in like in a, maybe a master's Grand Prix because I think it would be nice as well. So that's another, but that's another reason that like uh, I'm uh, hope like Sergio does well. I hope Cyborg does well because for me like we, we have talked about that in, in like past podcast that I believe the Jiu Jitsu Con is the biggest event in the world today in Jiu Jitsu when it comes to the numbers that are, when it comes to the community. And the martial world, I don't see any other event that has the number of insurance that martial world. So I think it's nice to see some martial athletes that are so professional athletes having that chance uh, and help grow as well. I, I think going to be like a side effect of like growing martial world with those guys doing well on, on that event. That's a great point. Let's move on to the fifth and final super fight. We have Eduardo Dudu Lima of Checkmat taking on Zach Kaina of AOJ, another AOJ competitor in the super fights. These guys, I believe they fought three times before with Eduardo get, getting the win in all the matches, but they've always been very, very close matches that could have gone either way. So how do you feel like Eduardo and Zach match up, and what do you feel like are the keys to victory for each of them? Uh, I think for for Zach, the key to victory is like fine I start where he can – Tie Eduardo, in a way that he's he's the one that's gonna be always leading the score. All right. Uh, I think Zach has to be able to lead the score from the beginning to be able to keep managing the match. Uh, I think Eduardo is like I, I used that term before here. I think he's a black belt world champion material. All right. I think he's a kid that once he makes the black belt, once he gets the black belt, he's gonna give him the black belt already, like making noise. You know, um, I think of uh, of course he's the favorite based on the results. So it's not like uh, opinions based on numbers, right? But and I but I still see him. I uh, style wise, I still see him the favorite. For me, going to be about if Zach can have a strategy where he can score first and manage the match from there, always being ahead on the score. I think that's going to be a key for him. It's like it's score first, you know, and then, uh, but I see Eduardo as the favorite for the match for sure. It's going to be a great one. We covered a lot of matches and a lot of competitors today. Yes. Five super fights, eight athletes in the absolute Grand Prix. Bruno, do you have any final thoughts on this event before we wrap this podcast up? I'm just like really glad that Abijev putting those uh, professional events now have like the the two Grand Prix like on the past event now gonna have that absolute Grand Prix, you know I know they have more coming up, so excited to that new phase uh, of Abijev on on the professional Jiu Jitsu. Abijev, in my view, I always tell this to everybody, is the biggest platform of Jiu Jitsu, is where you can start to make your name and then like you open an academy, seminars, privates, like build your own association, and build your own brand, and then like, and so, so many opportunities, right, that you can come from that. And I think now that they, really invest in that professional uh, aspect of just as well, like with Super Fights and Grand Prix. There's another another uh, chapter of a BJJF that they've been trying for a couple of years already, but now they really invest on that. Um, they putting together like a, a good show. The last the last Grand Prix was amazing. Yeah. So really hope really hope the athletes understand that because it is a, it is a partnership. All right, and then like every partnership is a two-way street. So, for me to provide a platform, you have to provide entertainment and a good matches so people want to watch, and that's how, like the ball keep rolling, right? So I think it's important for that to understand the opportunity, not take this just like as a oh like a match that I have to win by one advantage. I think they really have to try to entertain people as well because now they're not fighting for the medal they fighting for a money prize. So that's different. 
Yeah, it's going to be an incredible event. Like you said, the last one was amazing. This one's going to be amazing as well. The IBJJF Absolute Grand Prix goes down Friday, November 18th. You can watch it only on flowgrappling.com. And the event is brought to you exclusively by Black Armor Kimonos. Bruno, thank you again for joining me. And thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you guys soon for another podcast. Ooh.